Okay, so we begin. The last time we were looking at this theorem, which said that if n is a positive integer and lambda i, i going from 1 to n and lambda hat i, i going from 1 to n plus 1 are two sequences of real numbers such that they inter these, these two sequences interlace with each other, meaning that lambda hat 1 is the smallest of these numbers followed by lambda 1, followed by lambda hat 2, followed by lambda 2, etc. Up to at the very end, you will have lambda n minus 1 <coughs> is less than or equal to lambda hat. <coughs> lambda hat n is less than or equal to lambda n. This is less than or equal to lambda hat n plus 1. So lambda n hat n plus 1 is the biggest. Lambda hat 1 is the smallest and all the other numbers are in between. And if we denote the diagonal matrix containing lambda 1 to lambda n as its diagonal entries as this capital lambda, then there exists a real scalar, a real valued scalar, and an n length real valued vector y such that these other numbers, lambda hat 1, lambda hat 2, up to lambda hat n plus 1, are the eigenvalues of the real symmetric matrix A hat, which is lambda y, y transpose A, which is an n plus 1 cross n plus 1 matrix. Okay, so we were going over the proof of this. We had gone most of the way, but there's some part that needed to be completed. So we'll begin by uh, filling in the rest of this proof. So first of all, uh, lambda 1 through, just to recall where we were, Lambda 1 through lambda n are, of course, the eigenvalues of lambda. And further, by noting that the trace of a hat must be the summation of lambda hat i, while the trace of lambda it must be equal to lambda 1 plus etc. lambda n, we know that uh, this value a here, in order for lambda hat 1 through lambda hat n to be the eigenvalues of this matrix, a must be such that a is equal to summation i equal to 1 to n plus 1 lambda hat i minus the summation i equal to 1 to n lambda i. Okay, this is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, if we look at the um, characteristic polynomial of a hat, by definition, it is the determinant of ti minus a hat. And if we substitute that and expand it out, we were able to show that it can be written in the following form where it has a factor with t minus a minus yi squared over this t minus lambda i is showing up in the denominator here. Okay, times the product of these terms, i equal to 1 to n t minus lambda i. And note that this is exactly the characteristic polynomial of this matrix lambda. Now, what we want is that this p a hat of t must end up being equal to the product i equal to 1 plus n, 1 to n plus 1 t minus lambda hat i. That will ensure that lambda hat i, i going from 1 to n plus 1 are the zeros of p a hat of t. And so that this matrix, we can then be assured that this matrix has lambda hat 1 through lambda hat n plus 1 as its uh, eigenvalues. Now, uh, to do that, uh, we consider two functions. The first is f of t, which is the product. This is our desired um, characteristic function, which is the product i equal to 1, plus, 1 to n plus 1, t minus lambda hat i. And g of t is the characteristic function of capital lambda. And that is just the product i equal to 1 to n, t minus lambda i. Now, this is an n plus 1 degree polynomial. This is an n degree polynomial. So we can always write f of t to be some uh, g of t times t minus some constant c. That's because the t power n plus 1 term has a coefficient of 1 and the t power n has a coefficient of 1 here. And so it can be written as g of t times t minus c plus some r of t. This is a remainder polynomial and this has a degree at most n minus 1. Now if, uh, so obviously the t power n plus 1 coefficients here match already by construction. But if we compare the coefficients at t to the n, we did this the last time, we end up with saying that c must be equal to a. Okay, now further, because 
g of lambda k is equal to 0 for k going from 1 to n because there's a t minus lambda i factor here. What we have is f of lambda k must be equal to r of lambda k. So basically what this means is this r of t is uh, known to us at n points because we know what f of t is. It's just this polynomial. So we can substitute lambda k, k going from 1 to n, and we can calculate the value of f of lambda k that tell us what the value of r of lambda k is. And it's a degree at most n minus 1 polynomial, and it's known now at 1 uh, k uh, at n different points. Now, if we assume that uh, lambda k's are distinct, and uh, I, as I mentioned, we'll at the end talk about what happens when there are repeated uh, lambda k's. But if they are distinct, we can write the following Lagrange interpolation formula. So basically knowing the value r of lambda k at k equal to 1 to n, we can directly write out what r of t is. r of t is this polynomial here. And notice that it is it has a g of t divided by t minus lambda i. And g of t itself is this product of all such factors. So each factor will basically cancel one of these factors here. And so each of these ratios is a degree n minus 1 polynomial. And that is getting weighted by f of lambda i divided by g dash of lambda i. And then add it together. So overall this has a degree at most n minus 1. But this is the expression for r of t. So basically if you find, find r of lambda k, k going from 1 to n, you will find that it's equal to f of lambda k. So it, me it meets this uh, constraint that we have set on these uh, on r of t. Now if we use this formula here, f of t equals g of t into t minus c plus r of t, and we divide throughout by g of t, then we get that f of t divided by g of t is equal to t minus a, c is equal to a, minus this whole thing divided by g of t and the g of t g of t will cancel and so you're left with um, okay so here it was plus r of t so i write it as minus of minus minus i equal to 1 to n n f minus f of lambda i divided by g dash of lambda i times 1 over t minus lambda i now this this thing is so if i write it this way f of t is equal to this whole coefficient times g of t and g of t is this product here. And so now if you look back at p a hat of t, that also has the same form. It is t minus a minus something times the product, this thing, which is exactly equal to my g of t. So f of t is now uh, equal to the same is now, f of t is now in the same form as this p a hat of t. And so for these two polynomials to completely match, we just need to choose y i squared to be equal to this coefficient here minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, uh, since uh, f of lambda k hat equals zero for i equal to one to n plus one, we must have that if I substitute lambda k hat here, this must be equal to zero for i k equal to one to n plus one. This is another condition that uh, these, this polynomial uh, ratio here will satisfy. And as I said, this two, two are of the same form. So if you want these two to match, all we need is to set y i squared to be equal to this coefficient minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i. So for you, for you to be able to find a, a real valued vector y such that y i squared equal to the negative of this, we need that these numbers should be positive numbers. Then it then I can find a real valued yi such that yi squared equals this thing. So we just need to show that these are all greater than or equal to zero for i equal to one to n. So we now finally use the interlacing assumption. Notice that in the proof so far, we had not used this fact that this lambdas and lambda hats are an interlacing set of numbers. So we'll use this uh, interlacing assumption. And now if I take the, so you can see here that lambda one is between, is lower bounded by lambda hat one and upper bounded by lambda hat two and so on. So more generally, lambda i is lower bounded by lambda hat i and upper bounded by lambda hat i plus one. 
So what this means is that if I take any lambda hat j where j is less than i, then lambda i minus lambda hat j will be a positive number. This minus something which is on this side. And similarly, if I take any j which is greater than i, then lambda i minus lambda hat j is going to be negative. Okay, this is this is a smaller number. These are all all the lambda hats on this side are, are bigger numbers. Okay, and so based on that, if I look at what f of lambda i is, f of lambda i is um, the product of lambda i minus lambda lambda j hat j going from 1 to n plus 1. But out of these, all these numbers are positive and all these numbers are negative. So there, there are n minus i plus 1 negative numbers over here. And so if I pull that out, I can write this as minus 1 power n minus i plus 1 product j going from 1 to n plus 1, the modulus of lambda i minus lambda j hat. And similarly, g dash of lambda i is just the same product um, so g dash is this t minus lambda j, but not including the ith term because you are taking the uh, derivative and evaluating it at lambda i. And so the, this product, and again, all these terms will be positive and all these terms will be negative. So there are n minus i such negative terms. And so I can write it as minus 1 to the n minus i times uh, the product of um, all positive numbers, mod of lambda i minus lambda j. Okay, and so you see that this is multiplied by minus 1 to the n minus i plus 1. This is multiplied by minus 1 to the n minus i times a positive number. And so what that means is that f of lambda i and g dash of lambda i are will always have opposite signs because there's a plus one extra here. And so their ratio okay, will be negative or negative of that ratio will be positive. So that basically establishes that we can choose y i squared to be minus f of lambda i over g dash of lambda i. So the only thing left is to handle the case where there are repeated eigenvalues. So this is a very simple argument. Um, Suppose, for example, that lambda 1 equals lambda 2, which is strictly less than lambda 3 and so on. For all other cases, the argument is very similar. So the, we can consider an example like this and see what happens. Now, if that is the case, because it has this interlacing property, um, if lambda 1 equals lambda 2, then lambda 2 hat must be equal to lambda 1, and which is in turn equal to lambda 2. Okay. <coughs> So that means that f of t, which is the product of t minus lambda hat i, it has a factor t minus lambda 2 hat, which is the same as t minus lambda 1. Similarly, g of t has two factors, which are equal to t minus lambda 1. So you, it, it has a factor t minus lambda 1 square, because the first term and the second term are both t minus lambda 1 and t minus, uh, so the first term and the second term are t minus lambda 1 into t minus lambda 2. But since lambda 1 equals lambda 2, you have a factor like t minus lambda 1 square. And so uh, the, uh, the multiplicity of lambda 1 as a 0 of g of t is exactly equal to 2. And so um, what we can do is to modify our f of t, g of t, and r of t by dividing throughout by t minus lambda 1. And this modified polynomial will be exactly like before. It will have t minus lambda 1 as a simple root of g of t. And that was the reason why we assumed that the eigenvalues are distinct, so that the eigenvalues turn out to be simple roots. And then we can reuse all of the above arguments. So, uh, so that basically is the, is the proof. So the proof directly extends to the case where there are repeated eigenvalues. So, uh, so this argument, the, the main point of this argument here is that g of t always has one greater degree for repeated roots compared to f of t. And uh, that basically means that we can remove this common uh, factors and then we will be left with distinct eigenvalues. And we can reuse the same arguments as we used 
to establish the result. Okay, any questions about this proof? Okay, so what did this result tell us? It told us that if you are given a set of interlacing uh, uh, interlacing numbers, we can construct matrices such that the first set of numbers is uh, are the eigenvalues of a matrix, and the second set of numbers are the eigenvalues of a matrix that is obtained by taking the first matrix and bordering it on the right and below by y and y transpose res respectively, and on the bottom right by some number a. <coughs> so, uh, and the result prior to that uh, actually said that if you take a matrix a and then you border it by a vector y and on the right and, and y Hermitian below, and small a on the bottom right, you will get an n plus one cross n plus one matrix. And the eigenvalues of the n cross n matrix and the n plus one cross n plus one matrix interlace with each other. Well, there is no nothing very special about uh, adding a row and column to a matrix. The same result applies to deleting a, a row or a column, or in fact, the last row or column of a matrix. If, when you delete the last row or column, the eigenvalues of the reduced matrix will interlace with the eigenvalues of the original matrix. And of course, if you think about it, there is not no sanctity in deleting the last row or column. Nothing special about the last row or column. The results apply equally well if you delete any row or column. So when you delete any row or column, you, uh, you so if you take an n cross n matrix and delete a particular row and column, you get what is called an n minus one cross n minus one principal submatrix of that matrix. And the eigenvalues of a principal submatrix interlace with the eigenvalues of the original matrix. And uh, you can apply this uh, repeatedly, and then you will get interlacing results for uh, that have, um, you, you will get results related to the interlacing of eigenvalues. When you delete say R rows or uh, say uh, K rows and columns of a matrix. And uh, so this, uh, this, these kind of results are actually called inclusion principles. And um, here is one, one such uh, example result. So this is theorem. Uh, you can actually prove this theorem by using this result on adding a row and column uh, and converting it to deleting a row and column and applying it repeatedly. But then it's equally easy to prove this result directly, which is what we will do. So the theorem says that A is an N cross N Hermitian matrix and um, let uh, R be an integer such that one is less than or equal to R is less than or equal to N. Let A R denote any R cross R principal submatrix of A. So the, you obtain a principal submatrix by deleting n minus r rows and the corresponding columns. But so you have to delete the same row and column index. Okay, so then for each integer k, one less than or equal to k less than or equal to r, lambda k of a is less than or equal to lambda k 
of a r is less than or equal to lambda k plus n minus r of a. Again, we are arranging these eigenvalues in increasing order, so I didn't write that explicitly, but lambda 1 of a is the smallest eigenvalue of a, and lambda n of a is the largest eigenvalue of a, and lambda k of a r is the kth largest eigenvalue of the principal submatrix a r. Okay, so proof. So the essential ideas of this proof uh, we've already seen, so we can actually quickly run through the proof. So suppose A R is formed by deleting rows. Um, you have to delete n minus R rows. So I1 up to I n minus R and the corresponding columns. Of A. And uh, let one less than or equal to K less than or equal to R. OK, now just using the Courant Fisher theorem. Um, we have that. Um, so first of all, we want to show a lower bound like this. So for the lower bound, as you remember, as you might remember, we will use the uh, min max formulation of the result. So lambda k plus n minus r of a is equal to the min over w1 through w n minus this index and n minus this index is n minus k minus n plus r which is r minus k these are in c to the n the maximum over x not equal to 0 x in c to the n and x perpendicular to all these vectors of x Hermitian ax divided by x Hermitian x. Now, this trick is something we saw earlier. This is greater than or equal to the minimum over the same vectors w1 through wr minus k in c to the n. The maximum over x not equal to 0, x in c to the n x perpendicular to w1 through w r minus k. Now I'll throw in an extra set of constraints, x perpendicular to e i1 up to e i n minus k. So these are columns of the n cross n identity matrix corresponding to columns i1 through i n minus k. So I'm adding extra constraints here. So this maximum the solution to this maximization problem may not be as big as the solution to this maximization problem and that's why we have a greater than or equal to sign here. So the objective function is the same x Hermitian ax over x Hermitian x. Now if x is perpendicular to all these vectors then what I can do is to simply delete that corresponding row and column of a and then consider a reduced vector and then solve this over that reduced space so that reduced vector, I'll call it y, and y will be perpendicular to these vectors w1 through wn minus k, but with the indices i1 through in minus k deleted. Okay, and those I'll call v1 to vr minus k. So this is exactly equal to the minimum over vectors v1 through vr minus k in c to the r, the maximum over y not equal to 0, y in c to the r, and y perpendicular to v1 through vr minus k of y Hermitian ar 
y over y Hamitian y, which is exactly by the Kuron Fischer theorem itself equal to lambda k of AR. Okay, so that proves this part of the inequality. And similarly, lambda k of a, now we want to show an, an upper bound, so we'll use the max min version. So this is the maximum over w1 through w k minus 1 and c to the n of the minimum over x naught equal to 0, x and c to the n, x perpendicular to w1 through w k minus 1 of x Hermitian a x over x Hermitian x. And now I use the same trick again that this is less than or equal to. If I throw in extra constraints on the minimum, I may not be able to minimize it as well as I'm doing it here. So the final answer may turn out to be larger than whatever I get here. So this is the max over W1 through WK minus 1 in C to the N of the minimum X not equal to 0, X in C to the N, X perpendicular to W1 through WK minus 1. And now X also perpendicular to EI1 through EI N minus R of X Hermitian AX over X Hermitian X. But if X is perpendicular to all these, the uh, entries I1 through I N minus R of X are always equal to zero. So those particular rows and columns from A can just be deleted because there, there's nothing to optimize over there. And correspondingly, I can delete those indices in W1 through WK minus one and call them, call the resulting R dimensional vectors as V1 through VK minus one. So this is exactly equal to the maximum over V1 through VK minus one in C to the R, the minimum over Y not equal to zero, Y belonging to C to the R, and Y perpendicular to V1 through VK minus one of Y Hermitian AR Y over Y Hermitian Y, which is exactly equal to lambda k of AR, which is the result we wanted to show. So that completes this proof. So one, uh, one immediate consequence of this, this result is something called the Poincare um, separation theorem. And this is very useful, for example, in quantum mechanics, uh, in situations where one has information about UI Hermitian A U J for orthonormal vectors U I and U J. So you don't get to observe the whole matrix A, uh, but you get to observe projections of this matrix using a set of orthonormal vectors. And then what can we say about the eigenvalues of the original matrix in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix obtained by forming these projections? So here is the corollary. A is in C to the N cross N emission. And one less than or equal to R less than or equal to N. So R is some number between one and N. Let U1 through UR in C to the N be R given orthonormal vectors. Okay, and define the matrix BR with ijth element equal to ui Hermitian a uj. Okay, and uh, notice that BR is a matrix in C to the R cross -up. If the eigenvalues of A and BR 
are arranged in increasing order. Lambda K of A is less than or equal to lambda k of br is less than or equal to lambda k plus n minus r of a. So basically what this says is that instead of observing a, if you get to observe ui Hermitian a uj, and then you arrange that in a matrix BR and then you find the, so this is a smaller matrix, possibly a much smaller matrix of size R cross R, then you can say something about the eigenvalues of A. So specifically the kth eigenvalue of A is at most the kth eigenvalue of BR and um, the n uh, k plus n minus R eigenvalue of A is at least equal to the kth eigenvalue of BR. So this allows you to bound the eigenvalues of A in terms of lambda K of BR. Okay, so uh, the proof is very short. It's just basically pointing to the previous results that we are going to use. So if uh, R is strictly less than N, so if R equals N, uh, that's almost trivial, but if R is less than N, I mean, the next step that I'm going to say is not required if R equals N, because U1 to U, UN, if R equals N, U1 to UN are uh, form an N cross N orthonormal matrix together when you stack them into a matrix. But if R is less than N, we can choose N minus R additional vectors. u r plus 1 up to u n such that the set u1 through u n form an orthonormal form an orthonormal set and let u be defined as this matrix U1 through UN in C to the N cross N. Now U is unitary. So which implies that the eigenvalues of U Hermitian AU are equal to the eigenvalues of A. And uh, that means that the given BR is a principal submatrix of U Hermitian AU just obtained by deleting the last N minus one N minus R rows and columns. Okay, so the, that's it. So now we can use the previous uh, theorem. It's just deleting n minus r rows and columns, and we can use the previous theorem, and that's exactly what the previous theorem said, that the eigenvalues have this, this relationship. Okay. Okay, so in fact, uh, this result itself is very useful. Um, you can use it to show many more results on um, uh, many more variational results on eigenvalues. And there are lots of results in the text. We just don't have the time to 
uh, systematically cover them in this course, but you can look at the text and find many more interesting results. Now, um, uh, uh, recall that the diagonal elements of um, uh, Hermitian symmetric matrix are always real because if it's Hermitian symmetric, uh, A equals A Hermitian. And if you equate the diagonal ele elements, it means A must be, A I I must be equal to A I I star. In other words, the diagonal entries must be real valued. Also, the eigenvalues of a Hermitian symmetric matrix are real valued. We've seen that also. Furthermore, the diagonal entries and the eigenvalues have the same sum. That is, the trace of a matrix is equal to the sum of its eigenvalues.